Welcome to Lesson 4 of our adult Bible class series we're calling The Unity of the Spirit and the Bond of Peace. The title's taken straight from Scripture. We've been studying the different passages in the Bible that relate to the unity of God's people. It's been a difficult couple of years. We've seen that unity tested, and so we wanted to remind ourselves uh, of what Scripture says about our obligations to each other and our obligations to unity. We're putting some of these lessons online because we know this is a strange time. As the Omicron variant is sweeping through, we've got lots of people who are out sick, others who are isolating because they've been in contact with those who are sick. So that means we have a number of our own Sunday teachers who might not be able to make it and a higher need for subs. And so we thought we'd put these lessons out in case they were helpful to some of our classes. We're also putting this out on YouTube in case maybe your home and you want to attend Bible class on Sundays, but maybe you don't have a Zoom option with your typical class anymore. Maybe you're watching from around the world. You've tuned into our live stream and you want to check out what a Bible class is like. So this isn't the exact same experience because it's just me talking to a camera, but I'm grateful for this opportunity to study God's Word with you as we dive in to this lesson on unity. Uh, and the title for this lesson is One Body, Many Members. And we're going to look at a passage in Romans where Paul talks about uh, the diversity of spiritual gifts that exist within the church. So a question to get you thinking, what if everyone in the church were exactly like you? What would be some of the advantages and disadvantages? You know, we often think, oh, things would be better if everyone thought like me. But if we're honest, we know that that's not true and that it's important to have others who are not like us. And so I recognize the things I'm gifted at and the things I'm not gifted at. And I'm grateful that there are others around who are uh, gifted at things that I'm not uh, because they really are such a blessing uh, to the church and to the community. So you might, if you're with a group, you might think about some humorous ways uh, that it would come to pass if everyone were just like you in the church. And what would happen, what would be the good parts about that, and what would be the bad parts about that. Well, let's read this passage in Romans chapter 12 together. We're going to begin in verse uh, 3. Paul says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. So there's Paul's passage laying out the different spiritual gifts, but I want you to notice, because our focus today is not necessarily going to be on what each gift does and how you know if you have that gift. I want you to notice how Paul begins and ends this passage. Look at the beginning. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. And then toward the end, honor one another above yourselves. So what I'm wanting you to see is that this well-known passage on different spiritual gifts is bookended by statements about putting ourselves in proper perspective in relation to others. It begins telling us not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. It ends reminding us to honor one another above ourselves. And everything in between is related to those commands. So in other words, while, yes, this passage is about using your God-given gifts, it's just as much about acknowledging with gratitude the gifts others might have that you might not have. Paul states that God has distributed faith to each of us. That's verse 3. So in, in this way, no one is better than another because we all have different gifts. 
And Paul's going to use the image of the body to make his point. So just as we each have an anatomical body with anatomical members, not all of which have the same function, verse 4, so the church, the body of Christ, has many members, not all of which have the same function. That's verse 5. And not only that, but Paul says the members belong to each other. We are not our own. Even this image on the screen is not quite accurate, right? We know that uh, the church is not a building, but is in fact made up of the people. But I think this, this contrast just, or this comparison just helps remind us that Paul's using this image of the body. Now, we understand that the parts of our body do different things, but, but we need them all. And so the same thing is in the church, that there are different functions, but they're all important. So here's the list of some of the gifts that Paul mentions, prophesying and serving and teaching and encouraging, giving, and leading, and showing mercy. And for a few of these, Paul will tack on some additional instructions or some adverbs or some modifiers. So if it's prophesying, do it in accordance with your faith. If it's giving, do it generously. If it's leading, do it diligently. If it's showing mercy, do it cheerfully. But I don't want you to get hung up on the differences in the descriptions. I don't, I don't think the point is to ask something like, well, why does Paul command giving generously but showing mercy cheerfully? The, the adverbs are not the point. The main point Paul is saying is use your gift well and use it to the fullest. So if you've got this gift, do it in abundance, right? That's what he's saying. And so this whole passage is Paul just saying, hey, you find your lane and you run in your lane the fastest you can while acknowledging that this is not some competition of some race to see who's the best or the fastest, that others have their own lane and their job is to stay in their lane and do their lane to the fullest. And the whole time we are grateful that we all have different lanes to be in because they're all working toward the same thing. We've got a common goal, and we're grateful that others have these gifts. It causes us to honor them and not to think of ourselves more highly than we should. Let's take a trip to the Old Testament and look at one passage in particular that illustrates this idea of um, welcoming others' giftedness. Okay, so sometimes we just get caught up thinking everyone needs to be like us, and if everyone thought like I do, the world would be better, and if others worshiped and prayed and served like I do, that'd be best. But I think what we're studying today reminds us that it's important that others are not like us, right? Diversity of gifts is a good thing. I want to look at a passage that I think illustrates that pretty well. So we're going to go to Exodus chapter 18, and we are going to begin in verse 13. The next day Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people, and they stood around him from morning till evening. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, What is this you're doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge, while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? Moses answered him, Because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it's brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. Moses' father-in-law replied, What you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me, and I will give you some advice, and may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them his decrees and instructions, and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases, they can decide themselves. That will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this, and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain, and all those people will go home satisfied. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. He chose capable men from all Israel and made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. 
They served as judges for the people at all times. The difficult cases they brought to Moses, but the simple ones they decided themselves. So there's a story where Moses kind of felt like he was the only one who could do something and no one else had any gifts. And his father-in-law says, that's a bad way to operate. It's going to wear you out and you have failed to look for the giftedness of others and you have failed to empower them to use their gifts. Let them do what they can do and you do what you can do. And in this way, you don't have some sort of savior complex thinking, I'm the only one. No one else can do it like me. Letting others use their giftedness is a blessing to us in a couple of ways. It sometimes takes the work off us, but also it's a blessing to us because we learn to value others and see what they're good at. So there's a number of reasons we sometimes don't acknowledge the giftedness of others, but Paul's passage and this story in Exodus reminds us to seek the giftedness of others and to value that. So here's some questions for you as you think about this, whether you're by yourself or you're with a group where you can discuss. Here's a few things you might think about. In this story in Exodus, what was the problem that needed to be addressed? And what was the solution? How well did the solution work? I mean, what was accomplished? And what would have happened if Moses refused to believe others had important gifts and abilities to offer? And then let's talk about some broad application questions for us today. Rightly or wrongly, what spiritual gifts do you tend to value above others? Paul seems to think they're all important, but we probably all have our own biases. And so think for a minute about what you tend to value. And then maybe your answer might be different for this question. What do you think the church tends to value, right? Are there gifts that, whether we mean to or not, we tend to lift up and, and prioritize and, and praise more than others? And finally, how can the church do a better job of endorsing the value and equal worth of all spiritual gifts? That's what Paul is teaching. Yes, you're gifted. Yes, we're gifted. And so we need to work on those gifts and to spend our time in those gifts and do them to the fullest. But we have to value others' gifts equally and treat them as such. Let me close uh, with a prayer. Lord, we're all different, but we are your children. You have given us many gifts, and for those we are thankful. Help us to recognize not only our own giftedness, but also the giftedness of others. May we use our gifts together to your glory.